Um, so I am going to read from a collection of short stories um, that took me about uh, 48 years to write, and I got about that many rejections. Um, and it's coming out with Ann Schwartz at Random House, and it's due next month. And uh, I don't know. So I can use the mic. Yes, thank you. I actually wanted to use. Uh, I'll use this one. Though. All right, so I'm going to jump around a little bit, and I'm going to read one story, but I'm going to do a little showing you where it came from. And actually, I'm going to read you the author bio first for this book. So this is the author bio that's going to go at the end of the book, which is now called uh, The Kids Who Live on Belloc Road. It used to be called Strange Stories About Blah, 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 Blah. Um, <laughs> author bio. This is me when I was eight and a half years old. Back then, I lived on a farm with a mother, a father, an older brother, three goats, two sheep, a horse, a dog, a lot of cats, some guinea pigs, and two parakeets. Oh, yes, and a monkey, too. It's true. All of whom I loved very much. I spent a lot of time picking up stories and writing them down. Some of them were strange, funny, scary, happy, or even sad, just like the ones in this very book. Then, after a long, long, long time, and many more strange things happened to me, I got to the age I am now, and I rewrote some of these stories, and ta-da, here they are. <laughs> and I thought I would read you one of the stories that is actually not, didn't make it into the book, but there, I have like hundreds of these little things. Um, and this is sort of the stuff that I rewrote over my lifetime. Um, the Bird That Couldn't Fly. Once there was a bird, he wasn't the same as any other bird, he couldn't fly. One day, a little girl saw the bird, was scared, and he tried to fly more than ever, but he still couldn't fly. So the little girl picked him up and brought him home. Her mother was super, was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it can't fly, said the girl. That's why you brought it home, said her mother. Now take it back where you found it, she said in a very mean voice. <laughs> but, mother, someone needs it. No one needs it. Now take it back where you found it. I found it in the backyard, said Wilhelmina, apparently that's her name. <laughs> then put it back in the backyard, said her mother. I won't put it in the backyard. So her mother picked up the bird and threw it out of the house. I hate you. <laughs> Wilhelmina began to cry, for that was the only pet she had. The little bird, total sort of point of view here, the little bird didn't like that house, so he left the house. After a while, he saw a truck. He got on the truck. It started to move. The little bird got very scared. He didn't know where he was, but then he saw a car. In the car, he saw the same girl that he saw in the house, but he did not see the same mother. <laughs> Instead, he saw some, I want to say other mother here, but someone he, who he never saw before. They got out of the car and went into the house that was close by, and the little bird goes, Beep. The truck stopped right in front of the house. The bird got off the truck. Then the girl ran and picked up the bird. She threw it up in the air. He started to fly, and she kept the bird forever. And every day, she let the bird fly, and it always came back to her. Um, but I hope they're a little better. But the kids who live on Belloc Road, and I have a little map here because it's important where they live, and Belloc Road is a long and twisty road, and along it there is Bob, who is there, up on the right, um, who lives with his mother, and he gets a magic ball, and gets teased about it, but he doesn't care. And then Linda Lee lives in a first floor apartment with her nana Gigi, and she's very, 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 very mean always. Charlotta lives with a lot of aunts and uncles, her mother, her father, her little brothers and sisters and cousins in a tiny, tiny apartment. She got the dollhouse and she moves in. 
Um, Rodney lives on the third floor of an apartment with his two mothers, and unfortunately there was a very tragic elevator accident, so they always have to take the stairs down, and he gets a pet rock. Um, Winston doesn't like to do anything, he lives with his dad, and one day he does nothing all day, and he meets a monkey and gets a banana. Um, Hans is following a weird theme I'm noticing in children's literature, a resurgence of eating things. Um, Hans is fake mother, he lives with a fake mom, um, and he, she feeds him so many waffles, he turns into a waffle, and then she eats him, and then she goes up. Uh, and then she goes up. Real Maxwell and Ruby are twins, they live with their mother and father. Maxwell falls into a trunk in the attic and gets stuck and has like a party with some spiders. And Ruby is very, 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 very sad. Um, <laughs> Ursula lives over the, um, um, the second floor of the Liberty Gibbet toy store. And uh, she's very clever and she meets a ghost and destroys it. And Mr. and Mrs. Waddleby also live there. And Amelia lives all the way up the bumpy dirt path at the end of the pavement on a farm. And she lives with her big sister because her parents were killed in a tragic elevator accident. Um, and she starts singing and she never stops. So then that leaves us with who's left? Mateo. So I'm going to read you Mateo's story. Um, and I'm not going to read the intro because I kind of already explained it to you. There's also a park you can see and a rock and a willow tree and a swimming pool and a school and a zoo. Um, if you were here in January, that's where Ruby gets very sad and her mother goes to the zoo and she gets eaten by the lion. Um, so, yeah. A couple other people go to the zoo. There's a willow tree where they, Winston meets the monkey. There's a mud puddle where Linda Lee, who's very mean, falls into it and gets muddy. Um, so there's a few key things. but. Uh, let's see. This is actually story number 10, A Tiny Baby Froglet, the story of Mateo. Mateo lived on the other side of the tracks, the side where there was nothing but rocks and gravel, some dirt, a few bony trees, a muddy bog, and garbage. Do you know that side? Well, Mateo knew it all too well. He lived there all by himself in a big brown box. He wasn't old enough to live without parents, but as far as he knew, he didn't have any, he didn't even know what his last name was. Can you imagine that? He'd lived in his box on the other side of the tracks for as long as he could remember, ever since he was a baby. Who had taken care of him all that time? It seemed Mateo had done it all by himself, which was fine by him because his box was sturdy. Over the years, he'd added wooden planks that he found in the nearby dump and nailed on with rusty nails. His box never and what did Mateo eat? Well, he was clever and always found plenty of food that people threw out, like leftover pizza or sandwiches or crackers or oranges. Sometimes the food was a little stale, but other times it was absolutely fine. Once he'd even found a perfect yellow banana just in front of his box. It was delicious. Sometimes when a train sped by, Mateo would stand and wave happily to the passengers. They smiled and waved back. What a cute little brave boy playing all by himself by the train tracks, they thought. <laughs> Nobody worried that Mateo was sad or lonely because he wasn't. Actually, Mateo was very content with his life, or so he thought. One day, as Mateo was eating a delicious fresh avocado, which had rolled off an avocado train just that morning right next to his box, a tiny baby frog, which in case you didn't know is called a froglet, true, hopped onto his lap. Ribbit, ribbit, the froglet ribbited. Hello, tiny baby froglet, said Mateo. Would you like some avocado? The froglet nodded. So Mateo pulled off a tiny chunk of avocado with his thumb and held it out for the froglet, who gobbled it up eagerly. You see, the froglet was very hungry. Its, its parents had been run over by a train, and it had not eaten in two whole days. Oh. Mateo gave the froglet another bite of avocado, and another, and another. Pretty soon, there was only one bite left. Mateo was hungry too, but the frog looked up at him and his eyes were so sad that Mateo said, here, you have the rest. He held out his hand with the last bit of avocado in it. The froglet gobbled it down, gulp, in one bite. Guess what happened next? Do you think the tiny baby froglet turned into a prince who had been magically transformed into a frog by an evil sorcerer and had needed a nice kid just like Mateo to offer his last bite of avocado in order to turn the magic around and change back into a human in a puff of smoke? 
Or do you think that the froglet turned into a fairy godmother to grant Matthias wishes? No. I am sorry to report that neither of those things happened. That last bite of avocado didn't even make the froglet talk. <laughs> a tiny baby froglet just went ribbit, ribbit, and hopped away. Matteo watched, not at all surprised, because he had never read those fairy tales about frogs that turn into princes or fairy godmothers. In fact, he had never read any fairy tales before, very sad. Uh, or ever. Still, he was sad to see the froglet just hopping away. You see, Matteo did not get much company, and being able to share his avocado with a tiny baby froglet had made him feel good. It made him feel special. It made him feel needed. Things Matteo had never really felt before. Matteo looked at the froglet, who was now hopping happily along the side of the tracks. Then he looked at the avocado pit he was holding in his hand. Then he looked at his box that he'd built and lived in his entire and then Matteo made a decision. He jumped up and ran after the tiny baby froglet. The froglet saw Matteo chasing him and hopped faster, but not because he was trying to escape. He was playing a game of catch me if you can with his new friend. As Matteo ran, his running turned into hopping. Soon, he was hop, hop, hopping after the froglet. Then Matteo's long human legs turned into two hind frog legs, and his arms turned into two front frog legs. Matteo's skin turned green like the froglets. He sprouted a couple of warts, and his eyes bulged out just like a frog, and all of a sudden, poof, Matteo was a tiny frog. He wasn't quite as tiny as the tiny baby froglet because Matteo was not a baby, he was a kid. Well, actually, he was a former kid because now he's a frog. <laughs> ribbit, ribbit, Matteo, the frog, said. It was really fun to say, so he said it some more. Ribbit, 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 the froglet said. Matteo and the tiny baby froglet played Catch Me If You Can all afternoon. They hopped to the muddy bog where frogs like to go, and splashed about and caught lots of flies with their long, grubby, groggy, froggy tongues. And if you've never eaten a fly before, well, they taste pretty delicious. At least, Matteo and the froglet sure thought so. They met up with the froglet's many brothers and sisters and cousins and friends, and, oh, sorry, I rewrote this. They met up with the froglet's many brothers and sisters and cousins and friends who had all thought the frog had been killed with its parents by the train, so you can imagine how thrilled they were to find that that was not the case. The froglet had just been lost for a few days. They were all very happy to see it, and they all loved Matteo and made him feel just like part of the family. All his life, Matteo had thought he was happy as a kid, but this was so much better. And that is the story of how Matteo, the boy who lived on the other side of the tracks, in a box, became a happy little frog living in a muddy bog. Ribbit, ribbit. ribbit. <laughs>